brought to you by Orbital Assembly Corporation with your hosts, Dr. Jeff Greenblatt and Eric Ward. Hello, and welcome to the latest episode of Our Future in Space. In this podcast, we explore the technical, economic, social, political, and ethical considerations of moving humanity into the solar system in large numbers to work, play, and ultimately to live. Our species, it's at an inflection point in its evolution. We now have the ability to sustain life off planet for indefinite periods in low Earth orbit and soon throughout the solar system. Do we merely stay on the Earth and survive or expand outward into the solar system and thrive? Orbital Assembly is leading the way in the development of artificial gravity stations so people can live, work, and thrive in space. OAC's platforms are market category creators. They are backwards compatible with current standards, allowing for you to move from concept to production at the pace of business. To learn more, visit orbitalassembly.com. All right. I am your host, Dr. Jeffrey Greenblatt, the Vice President for Science and Research at Orbital Assembly. And I'm joined here, as always, by my co-host, Eric Ward, the Vice President for Engineering Design at Orbital Assembly. How's it going, Eric? Oh, it's going very well. I'm excited about our episode today. We have our guest, Dr. Casey Handmer, with us. He was born and raised in Australia, where he completed undergraduate studies in mathematics and physics and emigrated to the U.S. in 2010, earned his Ph.D. in theoretical physics and had stints at Hyperloop One and the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. In 2021, he founded Terraform Industries to capture atmospheric carbon and convert it into cheaper natural gas at gigaton scales. He's also written extensively about space technology on his private blog site, caseyhandmer.wordpress.com. Dr. Handmer, welcome to our future in space. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Yeah, we're super well, excited to talk yeah. to you about all things space. Go ahead, Eric. You already had a question. Yeah, well, yeah. you know... Uh, we've, you know, obviously read, you know, a lot through your blog, and it seems that you really look at space technology and civilizations from an economic perspective. And we're wondering what really drives that uh, that viewpoint. Well, I look at it from all different kinds of perspectives. Um, my interest is primarily, you know, in, in physics and the technical stuff, but um, it's also very interesting to kind of consider what makes um, what approaches might be affordable or relatively affordable. Um, of course, space is always expensive, but um, just recently in, in, in particular, I've been fascinated by the idea that it might be possible to uh, begin terraforming Mars, for example, without developing any new technology or um, building any infrastructure on the surface of the planet itself. Wow, we would certainly like to hear about that. I don't think we've interviewed anyone around terraforming Mars yet. Mm -hmm. uh, that sounds like a really juicy topic, but uh, before, before we go there, uh, I think another topic that we might want to ask you about is uh, a blog post that I guess you wrote close to two years ago that's gotten a lot of um, airtime called uh, Starship is a Very Big Deal. Do um, you think it's still a very big deal? And uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit why. Yeah, actually, those, those uh, two posts is uh, written back to back, kind of in, in a flash of inspiration. And, and as writers sometimes say, white heat uh, in November 2019, so almost three years ago. Um, and the, the Star Link post, uh, which is about uh, SpaceX's orbital um, internet satellites. Uh, it was kind of based on some notes that I'd done many years before, but the Starship one was was slightly more timely. Um, yeah, it's it's a super huge deal. Um, you know, I would have been very pleased if they had built and flown it years ago by now. But uh, obviously, these things are, are non-trivial and they take some time. And and um, and you know, I guess we can hold out hope that they might might get launched before the end of the year. Uh, in any case, they will get there sooner or later. Um, and I think that people. Particularly, I mean, like, frankly, a lot of the population is not that aware of what's going on in space anyway, but uh, but even space people are kind of not fully understanding what uh, Starship really means. Yeah, exactly. And uh, before you delve into why it or what it exactly means, I'm just going to uh, take a short commercial break. We'll be right back. Ideas are powerful things. Ideas drive us to broaden our minds and help us seek truth about the universe around us. We are Rogue Space Systems. Ideas above. Okay, so um, yeah, why don't you delve in and if you want to start talking about Starship, I'm going to bring up a nice image of it here. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, what, ex- what exactly does make it a big deal? You know, we have a, a lot of science listeners, but a lot of people in the general population as well. So maybe you can uh, you can help get everybody up to speed on, on what makes this such a such a, a big change. Okay, so if we want to do things in space, uh, we can um, derive certain benefits from being extremely clever about um, how we minimize cost, uh, in particular by reducing the weight of things that we move to space. So if you look at um, kind of legacy efforts in the area, we see you know, Mars Science Laboratory and, and various probes and so on are always made out of very uh, expensive and very, very lightweight materials. A lot of engineering effort goes into making them very light. But at the end of the day, if, if we as a species want to move significant quantities of people and cargo into space, we're just going to have to move a lot of cargo. And so it becomes meaningful to ask the question, well, if, if we're in the business of moving stuff as opposed to trying to move as little stuff as possible, um, how do we go about uh, maximizing the tons per year to low Earth orbit and minimizing the dollars per ton to low Earth orbit? And, and once you've kind of asked this question, uh, in some ways, just finding the right question to ask is the hard part. Um, the answers begin to kind of flow down from there. And, and Elon Musk has talked about this himself many times, which is that a fully and rapidly reusable rocket is the holy grail of rocketry. It's been, it, I mean, everyone's been dreaming about it since forever, uh, but it's extremely hard to do. Um, no one has ever managed to do anything before. Uh, I would argue that prior to Starship, no one had really even come up with a uh, defensible concept which would be able to, to do this you know, before the Starship concept was first unveiled in 2016. Um, and then subsequently kind of had several contacts with reality that significantly changed the, the design and the overall plan. Um, right. But, you know, what we're looking at in Starship is something where all the key technical risks, um, like I say not all, all of them, but like all the really major ones have been retired already. You know, uh, Raptor has been uh, has been matured, uh, the belly flop and the, the kind of um, control in, in free, free fall in the last, uh, say, 10 kilometers before hitting the ground and transition to vertical and then landing has been performed. This is stuff that if you told someone uh, even 10 years ago, oh, this will be done by 2021 or something or 2020, they would have looked at you like you were absolutely crazy. There's, there's no way it could be done. It's impossible. You're going to take something the size of a building and like flip it sideways and land it on, on rockets that are running a full flow stage combustion cycle, uh, methane oxygen cycle. Like, what are you smoking? That's absolutely crazy. And yet here we are. We live in we live in the, the branch of, of the multiverse where that has already occurred. Um, <laughs> And so I think it's it's important to note that you know SpaceX is well resourced. Uh, they have you know, thousands of very very clever people working on this night and day. Uh, they intend to make it a reality. Uh, and so we should probably ask ourselves, um, given that you know the timeline is somewhat uncertain, but the outcome really is not. What what does that mean? Uh, what what does it mean kind of in the medium and long term when right. something is able to move stuff to space more or less as easily as we can we can move stuff around on the surface of the Earth today? And, and, so, and just to put that in, oh, ahead, we're both so excited. Uh, <laughs> just to put that in some economic context, uh, Casey, I mean, we're fairly familiar with this, but for the rest of our listeners, uh, w- what kind of change in the cost of getting stuff to orbit are we talking about once Starship is fully functional? Okay, sure. So the um, the kind of rule of thumb, I'd say prior to 2015 or, or thereabouts, was that uh, it cost about $10,000 per kilogram about $5,000 per pound to put mass into low Earth orbit, which is the, the, the closest and easiest space to get to. If you want to go further than that, it costs more. If you want to go to the moon, it costs a lot more. If you want to go to Mars, it costs way more. Um, so um, you know, $10,000 a kilogram. Now, uh, Falcon 9 uh, as a, is partly reusable. They can they can reuse the first stage, um, and, and that reduces the cost somewhat. Uh, and so I think Falcon is currently flying at somewhere around $2,000 a kilogram. So it's a factor of five improvement uh, over yep. the kind of the pre yep. pre SpaceX supremacy uh, stage, and then the long term aspiration with with Starship is to reduce that by another factor of of one hundred, um, so down to around twenty dollars a kilogram. Um, twenty dollars a kilogram is still quite a bit more than postage. Uh, so if you were trying to post a, a package of a kilogram, um, you know, via surface mail, you know, somewhere in the United States or overseas, it would cost somewhat less than twenty dollars a kilogram. But it, it's it's I think probably somewhat comparable to like rush shipping by FedEx on the plane or something. Exactly. Like that. So it's like substantially cheaper. Uh, and so if you look at the major kind of implication for that is if you look at the overall cargo rate to orbit, it can be a lot higher, perhaps a hundred or a thousand times higher for the same net expense. Um, and and also the amount of time and effort that that sort of cost structure implies should be spent on say um, mass reduction engineering uh, changes a lot, frankly. So, so rather than spending you know, billions of dollars uh, trying to make a Mars rover, where I, I can tell you off the top of my head, um, the most recent Mars rover to land on Mars made about a thousand kilograms to order of magnitude. 
uh, and masses of various subsystems were tracked to one tenth of a gram, which is like less than the mass of a postage stamp. Um, so it's like seven orders of magnitude of mass tracking just to make sure that thing was not overweight. Um, obviously, mm. a lot of time and effort went into making, making that work. Yeah. You know, like custom yeah. extrusions and forgings of various kinds of aluminium and titanium and all kinds of fancy stuff. Um, if, if the cost drops by a factor of, of even five, that's probably not worthwhile. If the cost drops by a factor of 100, we should be asking ourselves not uh, how do we reduce the weight to save money, but how do we increase the weight to save money? How can we uh, trade this newfound right. to be able to launch a lot of you know, dumb mass, frankly, into space? Into saving us time and schedule when it comes to building these building these uh, robots on Mars. Or, That's actually or build the robots out of uh, off-the-shelf steel components that are a lot heavier for the same you know performance. But well, that's right. So if you look at how like uh, heavy machinery, which is called heavy machinery for a reason, uh, is made today, um, by and large, it'll start off with like you know uh, plate standard plate thicknesses of of mild steel and water jet it into a <laughs> shape and then and then uh, fit it together using jigs and and, and weld it in place. Um, and so, you know, it, it's a big steel box. There's nothing sexy about it. There's nothing light about it. Uh, in, in many cases, these things have to be heavy so they work properly. Um, now, I don't know if we would go immediately that to that extreme for building, uh, you know, uh, machinery to work on in space. But but certainly, you could take many steps in that direction before you started hit diminishing returns. I think. Mm -hmm. So yeah, as we yeah. as we can, you know kind of change this regime looking to instead of spending all of our money on reducing weight we can we can not worry about the weight or increase it in places in order to save money um you know that's obviously you know a big change in, in the in the way that you know spacecraft are are designed and 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 flown and built um but what what kind of broader implication does this have for the space industry? How is that you know beyond just changing the way the engineering organization is is written and how we track mass? You know how is that going to affect the the space industry as a whole? Well, I think SpaceX hasn't been shy about articulating their, their goals, which is they want to do a million tons to low Earth orbit per year, which is about two thousand times more than the, than the current rate. Mm -hmm. um, a million tons. I'm not even sure how much that translates to in terms of like number of shipping containers. Um, I think it's roughly like two or three very large shipping containers, uh, sorry, very, very large container ships worth of stuff yeah. per year uh, to low Earth orbit. Um, the vast majority of that would probably be uh, oxygen and, and, and to a lesser extent methane to refuel ships yeah. that are going beyond low Earth orbit. Um, but still mm -hmm. many hundreds of tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of tons of cargo. Um, so as far as SpaceX is concerned, it's super important because they are building a business around having exclusive access, or well, not exclusive, but like essentially preferred access at the cheapest possible rates to low Earth orbit so they can launch their generation two Starlink satellites, which are quite a bit more capable than the, the kind of the Pathfinder version one mm -hmm. um, to low Earth orbit. And that will provide the kind of the, the revenue that they need to, to do other more exciting stuff in deep space that doesn't necessarily have um, a, a rapid track to monetization, such as this this lovely image that they uh, they got rendered a few years ago of, of what their Mars base might look like. I actually think that it probably won't look much like this, but um, but it certainly <laughs> is pretty. I won't, I won't, I won't, I won't argue with that. And it, and it yeah, features prominently the SpaceX Starship, so uh, makes sense why that rendered went that way. Well, you mentioned Starlink there, and um, how do you see that kind of fitting into this this plan of Starship and that and that kind of whole whole program? Yeah, well, I think when Starship was first unveiled, they, they didn't really have a clear vision for how they would make the money that they needed to to do the Mars to do the Mars base or whatever, do Moon base or Mars base. And certainly, like the, the primary goal there would be for, like Uncle Sam to write them a check, uh, because even though SpaceX and, and actually Tesla as well are enormously uh, valuable companies with thousands and thousands of employees, um, really compared to the the economic might of of the U.S. government, it's uh, it's nothing. It's it's impossibly tiny. Um, I don't know, there are various, various ways that you can kind of illustrate that. Um, uh, but you know, the US government directly employs like tens of millions of people, I think. So it's it's not even close. Um, and so it would be ideal that, you know, if SpaceX was able to show that the technology, that their rockets and so on provided a path for uh, quote unquote sustainable and um, and, and relatively inexpensive um, you know, operation of facilities and bases and stuff on the moon and Mars that, that NASA would kind of you know, take the idea and run with it. Um, but they could also self-fund it potentially, and it does not hurt to be incredibly wealthy if you're trying to do that. One of the ways to do that is to is to basically run the entire internet through your constellation. That's kind of what Starlink was set up to do. One of one of several different ideas that, that SpaceX kind of explored over the years uh, for ways to kind of build a strong defensive mode and then and then a very very high 
net margin business. Um, and Starlink, I think, is the first one that's kind of hit prime time. Um, but it's a, yeah, it's a super cool, super cool idea, um, kind of in the limit. Um, have have enough satellites around the Earth that you can um, kind of convert the otherwise underutilized uh, you know, free space uh, between those satellites and the surface of the Earth into kind of a holographic. Um, that's a very technical term of art. Basically, a shitload of radio waves um, <laughs> to to <laughs> transmit data up and down and between different humans and kind of bring billions of humans together into the same cybernetic collective. Um, yeah. I, think it's a, I mean, and we're doing that now. I mean, just to jump in, Casey, I mean, I, yeah. I have this image of uh, sort of the Starlink nominal, you know, altitude versus where geostationary satellites are. And we can talk about the relative advantage of that in a couple of minutes. But um, just to this point that, I mean, we have a worldwide dense network that includes some really thick uh, trunk lines that connect continents through undersea uh, fiber optic cables. And, you know, we have some satellite links, but it's mostly land based. How does um, how does Starlink really change that picture, and why it would be such an attractive uh, business, um, you know, business opportunity for for uh, SpaceX or anyone else who does that? Yeah, well, I mean, as I pointed out in the original blog, um, you know, most national telcos are kind of um, government monopolies or concessions, and they're not well known for being incredibly competitive on cost um, mm -hmm. or competitive. Uh, com incredibly innovative. I mean, they provide a, a service that's, you know, like most utilities, uh, its primary function is to work 24 hours a day, no questions asked. And, um, and so there's kind of not that much room on the margins for, you know, excitement, but, um, but certainly you know, the, the internet traffic has been growing by something like 25% per year since forever. Uh, and there's no reason that why that would slow down now. And, and there is a limit to kind of how quickly, um, optical fiber can be, uh, unrolled across the surface of the earth. Um, and, um, people say, well, it's just roll off the back of a ship. It seems pretty easy to me, but the reality is, and I think Neil Stevenson has a fabulous essay on this, that like just landing one of these cables is like a, a huge, uh, kind of pain in the ass. Um, it's incredibly, uh, incredibly time consuming and difficult and you know, in, in, in energy and, and labor intensive infrastructure to, to build these uh, data transmission links around the world. And, um, and then the advantage of of the satellite approach is that you know not only can the data be faster and, and routed faster because it's not going through glass and, and not only is the, the bandwidth not limited by the transparency windows of glass and the operating uh kind of wavelengths of what are called opium dot fiber amplifiers or edfas um so you have potentially much higher bandwidth um but also the marginal costs uh are like um it's, 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 it's got more in common with with like air, airlines and, and airports compared to like rail lines and railways um, in that, mm -hmm. um, the, 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 co the cost of custom, customer acquisition is, is more or less directly the cost of them buying a terminal they can stick on top of their house, um, which we already right. understand from their financial models is something that you can pay off with less than a year of operation. And almost all people, you know, don't switch their internet providers more than once a year. In fact, many of them never switch them. Um, and, and certainly if you're in the middle of nowhere and SpaceX, uh, Starlink is, is the best internet option by like a factor of a thousand, you're unlikely to switch them. Um, and then. In terms of like the marginal revenue per satellite, um, it launched another satellite. Uh, you know, spends most of its time kind of flying over oceans and stuff that are largely uninhabited. But uh, when it does go over cities, you know, it, it it gets its share of the of of the data, and, and it's it's highly unlikely that that the kind of revenue per orbit or something will saturate anytime soon because uh, human population centers and particularly financially powerful population centers are so dense that um, that you know, the problem that satellites have is is serving that demand, not uh, not saturating that demand. So um, I think overall, it's you know, we have the potential here to, to kind of um, use everything that humanity has gotten super clever about over the last you know, 50 years with um, you know, satellites and computers and, and uh, completely digital radios and things like that to, um, to really kind of um, advance the state of the art here. And if you think like, okay, let's take that 25% growth per year of internet traffic and, and, and scale it for 30 or 40 years, it's really hard to imagine that you could move that much traffic by optical fiber. Um, but you, know, mm -hmm. you could move that much traffic by essentially uh, filling up the sky, you know, within certain bands, obviously, uh, with, with radio transmission. And that's kind of what we're seeing happening now in 2022, certainly sooner than I thought it would. Yeah, and it's, as you said, there's certainly no uh, stopping point in sight for how much data people want. If anything, our hunger for data is really starting to balloon with the advent of AI and you know, high definition video, virtual reality, all kinds of, you know, very bandwidth hungry uh, applications that seem like 
you know we all want a piece of and it if it improves everyday life why not right as long as you can afford it so um, yeah that all makes sense yeah well um, and, you know, the marginal benefit of additional data capacity is relatively low as is the marginal revenue but it's it's enough that it's competitive and that's all that really matters it's we're, we're kind of post scarcity already as far as data goes but that doesn't mean that we can't improve provision right. any further oh sure so um, I guess my question then is, all right, that makes sense. We This might be a better next uh, technology for uh, fueling the uh, the continuing internet revolution as far as connectivity, but uh, bring it back to Starship. Why is it important for Starship success and for uh, space economics overall? I, and of course, I'm assuming that it is important. So that should be my first question. Is it? And if so, why? Well, I don't think it's coincidence that that SpaceX, you know, essentially built built the Starlink network and then and then built Starship and then made sure that Starlink and Starship would only work together. I mean, it, it's at one level, it's it's not that much different from from you know NASA insisting that Orion can only fly on SLS and SLS can only fly with Orion and so on. You know, it's kind of like you know, creating an interdependency. Um, but it also means that, that SpaceX as an organization will be kind of directly able to intermediate uh, enormous flows of of economic growth and value. Um, which is kind of what it needs. Um, so just to kind of put that in perspective, um, you know, it's possible to make quite a lot of money launching rockets into space, but uh, as a fraction of the overall economy, it's a couple of billion dollars a year. It's not a huge, not a, not, not, a, not sort of the river of gold you would need. A couple of billion dollars a year is not really enough to run uh, a Mars city probably. Um, but the global uh, telecommunications industry is, is worth probably a thousand times that. Um, so um, you know, even though necessarily provisioning internet is a lower margin business than launch, um, the overall size of the pie is so much larger that that, um, that I think this you know, SpaceX plays their cards right and, and doesn't have any you know, catastrophes that they'll probably end up uh, being the most valuable country, uh, company on Earth uh, in the in the reasonably near future, um, which is a good thing. You know, if if you if you're in the business of, uh, of of building cities on other planets, it's something you need a lot of money for. <laughs> yes, for sure. Um... Eric, do you want to ask a question? I, I, I have well, another one queued up, but I well, I thought that was a good segue to kind of get into the um, building cities and other places. You know, we we talked about, um, you know, kind of hinted at at Mars, and you mentioned terraforming without new technology. So maybe we can go there. You know, if if SpaceX, you know, has this aspiration and is trying to set themselves up financially to build a city on Mars, you know, what what does that look like? Yes, I mean, terraforming in cities are two different things. Um, you could do one or the other or both or neither, frankly. But mm -hmm. um, as far as cities go, I think it's important to, to kind of begin with the requisite threat clearing, which is that um, I don't really know what Mars cities will look like. Uh, no one does. We've never built one before. Um, by the time we build one, we will obviously know a lot more about it than we do now. Uh, the people who live there will have forgotten much, much more about it than, than mm -hmm. you or I or the, the unity of humanity's knowledge now, yeah. right now, knows about building cities on Mars. Um, and so instead, we say, is, well, given that we know basically nothing, what can we know? And um, and there you kind of, I look at pictures like this one, um, which is, as I said, beautiful. But I think, is that is that really how it goes? And, and you see a lot of different images in, in science fiction and so on. Um, but at the end of the day, the, the science fiction authors are humans, just like you and me. They, they don't necessarily have the ability to see the future. So um, I start to ask myself, well, you know, based on, on you know, a small number of relatively defensible axioms, what might we think? A Mars city or a, or a Moon city or something would actually look like, um, and in particular, if you're designing around Starship, a lot of the constraints that you would have had to build in, if, for example, you were trying to bootstrap a, a Mars city based on something like SLS or or Falcon 9 or Falcon Heavy, uh, kind of change, um, and so you end up with kind of a, a very different vision for for what these cities might look like. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but essentially, you could you can think of them as kind of falling into two buckets, and one of them would be like, is this an outpost? So is it like an Antarctic station or something? It's a relatively small number of people. Um, mostly support staff and scientists who are there just kind of hanging out and doing science and and really performing a kind of strategic geostrategic purpose of, of having humans in a space or is this a, a city for real is this like okay we're actually going to make a go of this and, and actually try and build a local industrial stack that can do you know, full cell sufficiency uh, and those are two different kind of visions i think one of them the first the first one's relatively straightforward it's a it's an outpost of a certain size maybe slightly less awful than, than the one depicted in in the TV show for all mankind, but still, you know, relatively um, concise in scope, scale and scope, perhaps comparable to an aircraft carrier at most, you know, a few thousand people. Mm -hmm. um, and then for the city, you start asking yourself, well, what is the minimum number of people needed to um, to actually, you know, have a go at uh, have a go at um, doing the full industrialization thing? And that's a very, very large number of people. It's probably at least a million people. 
And so once yeah, you've got, I mean, you know, well, we need to see a million people, what is that going to look and feel like? Well, it probably won't be, you know, a laboriously head excavated by by uh, astronauts with picks and shovels underground to avoid right. radiation, right? And and since they're in the business of building gigantic factories, which is the whole point of industrialization, uh, most likely the whole thing will be you know, something like a modern car plant, where it's like all on single level with very high ceilings and and um, big open wide you know, smooth roads and stuff for big machines and, and things to move around. And meanwhile, the whole thing will have to be um, partitioned with a series of bulkheads and so on to to allow atmospheric isolation between different sections and yeah. and kind of compartmentalized to avoid catastrophic failure in the event of of, of damage to a um, to a pressure pressure vessel. Uh, speaking of which, the whole thing you know we can't we can't uh, industrialize a city if we're running around in spacesuits. So the interior will have to be climate controlled. <laughs> Um, yeah. you know, essentially as the interior of most of our buildings are right now, uh, but on a much, much larger scale. Uh, and then it would be ideal if the whole thing was walkable. You know, there's no reason to export LA traffic to Mars, especially if the population <laughs> is only a million people. So, you know, what does that start to look like? And 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 very quickly it becomes clear that, that you know, contrivances such as domes, for example, are, are very, very hard to build uh, at the required scale um, and very, very hard yeah, to see. There's an image of a dome in this, Im in this uh, picture. Yeah, there's an image of the dome going. in this picture. It looks beautiful, you know, but... Um, they did actually try and build a dome at the South Pole. Um, uh, the South Pole Station had a dome for, for several years, but uh, it ultimately got buried by snow and, and was going to be crushed, so they removed it. <laughs> but um, but certainly, as as far as as pressure pressure vessels go, they're not they're not ideal. Um, but I think something that's more like an air mattress could work quite well. So you have like a basically a tensile membrane that's anchored to the ground at, at regular intervals with steel cables um, that is able to. Um, yeah, but essentially, uh, with relatively low effort and cost and mass, enclose extremely large areas of the surface of the planet, um, and that would enable, uh, you know, essentially thousands, if not millions, of people to to live and walk around without having to, you know, dig enormous holes or yeah. uh, or, or build enormous it, rock vaults or okay. or you know set up a gigantic cement plant or something like that, you know, as the first order of business. Um, right. So yeah, I mean, there's sort of, let's sort of we're, we're not quite sorry. Yeah. We're, we're, we're not, Sorry, we're kind of skipping over this question of, well, why would you need to go underground versus these domes? It sounds like you're focusing on it primarily from a practicality point of view. It's easier to excavate large areas that are pressurized underground versus a large dome, but there's also the other major issue of, of, of space radiation, right? That we're trying space to avoid. radiation, yes. Yeah. Well, so, so um, it's true that, that there's more radiation, and by that we mean nuclear radiation, uh, in space than there is on the surface of the Earth. Um, mm -hmm. And it's also true that if you are an unshielded human or a minimally shielded human in deep space during what's called a coronal mass ejection, which is um, when the sun gets angry and, and throws a bunch of material, um, <laughs> that, that you would die extremely quickly. You would, you would die of prompt radiation illness, as, as many people, not many, but like some number of people did after Chernobyl, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, not a pleasant way of going. And actually, some some uh, U.S.-based nuclear scientists died that way in the 1940s as well, um, due to various handling accidents and mishaps. Hmm. Um, but you know, it's it's relatively relatively ha relatively straightforward to uh, to shield against that sort of radiation uh, with with a relatively narrow mass, um, ten uh, so four, four to eight inch uh, shell of water or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. And so then, then the, the concern becomes uh, cosmic rays, which are much, much higher energy particles um, that we are shielded from here on Earth by the atmosphere, um, by and large, uh, and, and which in deep space, it's, space, it's es essentially impossible to shield against them. You need many, many meters of lead uh, to shield against them. And they come from all directions and they do right. damage your DNA. Um, yep. and, and so the question then is like, do they increase the odds of dying of cancer? Um, it's controversial. Uh, I'll oh. say that straight on. It's controversial. So okay. first of all, I'll state that on Mars, the, the dose is lower. Why is that? Well, you, you don't have meters of lead, but you do have a planet underneath you, right? So like half, half of the sky is blocked out by a planet. Right. And then there is the atmosphere. It's true on the moon as well, right? That uh, that's right. That's on the moon. Uh, on Mars, okay. you also get an a, a thin atmosphere above you, um, which all, all up is equivalent to roughly uh, four inches of water in terms of shielding. So on the surface of Mars, you're essentially safe from um, perhaps all but the very largest of, of solar storms. Um, and even then, you could probably walk it off. Um, so then the question is, if you're taking 200, 250 millisieverts sitting on the surface of Mars, un unshielded, you know, throughout the day, um, so, you, so essentially you're like living in a rover or something, so you're not even like in, a, in some kind of, um, you know, building with a roof, 
uh, does that does that correspond to a higher rate of cancer? And, and I say it's controversial. There's there's um, there's a little bit of evidence both ways. There's actually um, there's kind of three different models for how radiation damages you. One is the no threshold, uh, you know, kind of linear dose model, uh, which says that you know the more you get, the worse it is. Um, and then there's one that has like a, a threshold that says below some threshold you're fine. Um, there's there's models that say that below some threshold is actually worse than you'd expect. Uh, and then there's some models that say below a certain threshold there's actually benefits to radiation. Um, yeah. And the, the thing is, like we have we have some evidence, you know, accidental exposures, uh, people who live in higher areas of natural background radiation than others, uh, people who live in the area around Chernobyl even today, animals that certainly do and have thrived since humans buggered off mostly, um, and uh, people who got exposed to a steel made with contaminated cobalt, for example, yeah. um, people who work with radium in the pre nineteen uh, you know, in the 1930s, for example. Yeah. Um, and and the, the thing is, like, when all this is taken into account, we don't really have good evidence one way or the other. That the best evidence I mean, is certainly that children acute have a slight increase in rates of certain kinds of blood cancers uh, with, mm. with exposure towards the higher end of the scale. But even then, that's only based on studies of, of one population of people from one building in Taiwan. Um, yeah. So, ah, we just don't know. Um, that's it. <laughs> On yeah. Mars, it would not be that hard to to make your hab have you know enough shielding on the roof that that wouldn't be a concern at all, right? Like mm -hmm. basically some sandbags on the roof. If you're doing a tensile tent-like structure, uh, it is possible to to build that roof you know 100 meters high, 200 meters high, as long as you want the cables to be, as long as you have enough, enough atmosphere. Um, mm -hmm. And 100 meters of of air and atmospheric pressure, Earth atmospheric pressure is equivalent to another 10 centimeters of water. So you can double your shielding uh, on the surface of mm -hmm. Mars. Um, Simply by um, simply by having like you know high high vault like ceiling like you know uh, Gothic cathedral style right. a ceiling yeah. full of just just an air no water no nothing no special jacket no nothing just just extra air. Um, Presumably, so, people would like that psychologically anyway, right? I mean, we kind of like open yeah. spaces, especially on I think it's planet. Safe. Well, here's the thing: so the gravity is lower there, so osmotic pressure yeah. works. Uh, sorry, not osmotic. Um, cap capillary pressure works higher. Mm -hmm. So, so if you took giant redwoods and planted them on Mars, they'd probably grow 350 meters high. So you should definitely <laughs> oh, wow. have a roof that's at least that high. Um, yeah, that'd be that'd be pretty awesome. Um, <laughs> and they're used to kind of bad soils and you know questionable rain patterns. So I think that'd be fine. Um, <laughs> maybe, maybe the tops would get slightly radiation radiation damage. That'd be interesting. <laughs> yeah. um, but if you made them made them tall enough, uh, I think yeah. that'd be that'd be pretty pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. And then so you have to say, well, okay. You know, there are actually populations of humans that live in areas with background radiation as high as the surface of Mars. Um, in, really? There's a place in, in Iran uh, called Ramsar that has uh, kind of natural hot springs that are, people have been using for health-related benefits since forever. Well, who knows? You know, pre pre-industrial medicine is always a bit iffy, but whatever. Um, but these these hot water has a very high concentration of radium in it, amongst other things. And there are houses in the area that have levels of background radiation that are equivalent to being on Mars. And mm. people there get cancer all the time, but they're also like old and they smoke a lot. So like it's really hard to like <laughs> deconflate these two factors. And in fact, there's no last time last I read, there's like no evidence amongst this relatively small population uh, that, mm. that the exposure to radium from the hot spring uh, is doing more damage than the exposure to radium from smoking. So um, it's it's kind of as I think Zubrin once said in a in a talk I saw years ago, you could take smokers, send them to Mars, make them quit. And you'd reduce the odds of cancer by a substantial fraction. Um, it's also it's also worth mentioning that like if you are getting sent out to Mars in the early days when the shielding is perhaps not quite as good, um, you'd be mm -hmm. like, how many people would we have to send to get a strong signal that they were dying of, of radiation related illnesses at an unnaturally early age, over mm -hmm. like them just dying of like accidents because it's going to be really mm -hmm. freaking dangerous in the early days, yes. like you know long hours and hard work and industrial machinery and things going wrong. So I know that's not a great argument. Like, don't worry, you won't die of cancer. You'll probably die of asphyxiation or <laughs> freezing or something. Like that. Um, but you know, you have to you have to look at these risks in totality um, to to really decide if like radiation is the thing that we're going to panic about. And I, I think it's mm -hmm. it's worthwhile keeping an eye on. But I actually think that it's it's vastly overblown in terms of um, in terms of like potential showstoppers. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I think well that's really very interesting. So essentially, to summarize, I guess what what you're telling us is that the jury is still out, but it looks as though maybe we could live on the surface of Mars or the surface of another planet without a substantial atmosphere like Earth's, um, at least some of the time. Uh, maybe we need some shielding, maybe we make a fairly thick dome, 
to provide some additional shielding, or maybe we have to spend a little bit of time underground, but you could still imagine a lot of your day spent on the surface. Is, is, that, is that an accurate summary? Yeah, the way I like to think about it is that, you know, but for um, steel cables that, that tie the roof down every 100 feet or so, um, the surface can be completely unconstrained. When it's first enclosed, it'll just be mm -hmm. Mars rocks and, and dust. Mm -hmm. And actually, yeah. there, there are various chemicals that are present in the dust on the surface of Mars that would, um, uh, let's say, exist in a state of like um, chemical disequilibrium because the surface of Mars is extremely dry and cold. But when you warm it up and make it a bit moister, that the reactions will occur. So you actually, these rocks will fizz quite a lot when they're first um, when they're first warmed up. Um, and so, yeah, and actually a lot of the gas that fizzes out of the oxygen, which is kind of convenient. Yeah. Um, so uh, you still want to run it through the uh, through the air processor, I think, before you mm -hmm. crack the helmet. But um, but certainly yeah. you know, once once the once the atmosphere is stabilized and and the surface is, mm -hmm. is warm and damp, uh, you can walk around in bare feet and and kick rocks and and you know, scoop mm -hmm. out holes and make make sand castles. Uh, and sure, we'll we'll grade areas and pave areas and mm -hmm. and, and carry on and plant plant trees and grass and other things. Um, but essentially, it would be no different to uh, what you would find building a, a, a irrigated greenhouse in an otherwise arid area mm -hmm. on the surface of the earth. Um, except in this case, people will be arriving with a certain degree of intention to like roll out 100,000 square foot factories and start yeah. making like boxes <laughs> and bearings and motors and yeah. robots and things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I guess you had hinted earlier that the uh, if you want to make a sustainable uh, settlement, you're not talking even a thousand people or two. It's it's more in the realm of millions, which is, I think, the number that Elon Musk has has uh, touted a few times to make a full industrial stack. Right. All the systems yeah. that we need to reproduce yeah. our technology. Um, I think that's probably fair. You don't know, um, do a half hearted. Um, <laughs> no one really knows. Um, you know, obviously, yeah. you need substantial innovation in both directions, right? So, like, one is like increasing the net productivity per person, and then the other is like reducing the net requirement for labor as as a function of the entire system. Um, mm -hmm. And you have to start somewhere. So, you start with a hundred or thousand people, and and then each time you double the population, you add another industry. Um, and so, you know, you pick you initially pick the industries that are revolve around like bulk processing of ore and uh, production of raw bulk materials, and then over time, you kind of work your way up the value chain. Um, I do have a blog about this, which is called. Um, Analyzing the make by question on Mars, where I kind of look at the the different. Um, there's kind of a couple of different cross cutting factors here. So, like one of them is that over time on Mars, you get more people and you get smarter and you get better at making things. But then at the same time, the spaceships that are sending things to Mars are probably getting cheaper as well. So, um, you need to look at the the relative impact of those two factors on whether it's a good idea to produce things locally on Mars or not. Um, and it actually turns out that for you know. A certain class of materials uh, into which you could you could put like um, certain pharmaceuticals, uh, certain things like memory cards or whatever. Um, it's highly unlikely that we, you would ever be able to produce them uh, cost competitively on the surface of Mars, um, even taking into account the transport cost, just because the embodied value mm -hmm. per capita is so damn high. Uh, so like, sure, the per capita consumption of uh, flash memory, for example, is so low that you could actually import a lifetime supply with you when you went to Mars. Mm -hmm. um, you could almost import a lifetime supply of Tabasco sauce, as an example. But um, <laughs> for like you know, drug, almost almost all drugs, for example, like, with probably the exception of alcohol, um, the, the the active dose is so low on a you know, grams per kilogram basis, and the usage rate is reasonably low. Like most people are not taking lots of morphine every day. Um, then you could import a lifetime supply when you first move to Mars. So it's like kind of downstream of the net value per kilogram of a human being. Um, right. So, so for that, well, that's say, re well, that's reassuring to know that you don't need like a. A full pharmaceutical industry is at present at that million you know, person You wouldn't scale, need one but... if you weren't able to import things, right? So, like, the whole point of the exercise is is you're able to build a city that that can sustain itself, even if the cost yeah. to ship things from Mars from Earth goes to infinity. Right. Uh, and so, yeah. the way you think about that is you say, well, at any given time, with some number of people on the surface of Mars, if the ship stopped coming or the capacity, the shipping capacity was degraded in some way, um, so like ninety percent or eighty percent, you know, success rate or something. Uh, how long would the would the uh, population last before they all like died or starved to death? Or something? Uh -huh. um, and ideally, that would be measured in in a large number of years, and those, that number would be growing over time. Um, uh -huh. right. If it isn't, then you have to ask yourself questions about like how are you managing logistics? As an example, uh, you mm -hmm. should be able to um, you should be able to withstand a, a reasonably small degradation in in kind of uh, shipping throughput with no net long-term consequences, or like very, very minimal long-term consequences. Like if there's some mission critical component 
you don't put it all on the one spaceship, on the one starship. Mm -hmm. You'd have to like split it across many, you know, ship, split the shipment across many different starships so that if one of them didn't make it, the rest would. And like, this is standard practice, like museums today right. that like, like are moving irreplaceable items like, uh, you know, the Codex Lester or something like uh, um, uh, Da Vinci's notebooks or something from one place to another. They will not put it all on the same plane. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, because yeah, accidents happen. They have a crash. Yeah. 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 Even if it's a low, low probability. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I guess this is really saying, of course, what we're also sort of implying certain assumptions about what our solar system is going to look like. And I think what you're hinting at is yeah. Mars should be self sufficient. And I'm just wondering if that yeah. is a valid premise because, I mean, yes, there's a possibility where Earth loses its uh, space capabilities and they have to sort of survive on their own. But it feels to me like there's a much more likely capability or situation where we just have increased trade between those two locations and probably others as well. But maybe in, yeah. because we don't know for sure what's going to happen, you got to make sure, make sure that self-sufficiency is part of the plan. Yeah. So I did look into this in some detail as well, uh, even taking into account reduced shipping costs and so on. Yeah. What would, what would the dolly value per kilogram or something have to be to make it worthwhile to ship from Mars back to Earth? Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. basically, the same goes for the moon, actually. As far as I know, there's, there's basically nothing. Um, you know, like, if you think about the properties that, that a particular kind of moon rock would have to have to make it worthwhile to ship it in bulk back to the Earth, it would have to confer eternal life. Um, like, something like that. Like, you'd have to go <laughs> out there and find some weird thing that you could not possibly make on Earth for some reason. And so, actually, if you look at Avatar, for example, which is, I think, 10 years old this year. Um, yeah. In that story, how do they justify the incredibly expensive, not just like shipping stuff from the moon, but like from Alpha Centauri back to the Earth? Well, <laughs> they have a, uh, a stable, um, you know, geologically produced room temperature superconductor that is produced on Pandora that they can get right, right away. If you look at Dune, uh, how do they mm -hmm. justify it? Well, Dune's tech economics is kind of iffy at best, but yeah. um, I, I love the story. Please don't send me hate mail. Um, <laughs> but they have this they easier, do. Uh, spice, Melange, which is... Um, which you know, expands consciousness and, and um, you know, essentially substitutes for the lack of uh, computers since the Butler Energy had. Um, if you look at uh, Cole Rainer Smith's classic in Australia, they have this uh, chemical called Stroom, which is extracted from um, kind of uh, mutant sheep uh, that are unwell on the planet um, and, and confers immortal, like uh, greatly extended life. Um, and so, like, you kind of you kind of come back to stuff like that. Um, even like that there are a handful of, of minerals, for example, which have a high enough dollar per kilogram value to justify shipping them from the moon or from Mars, you know, under some set of circumstances. Uh, but the total number of kilograms that are currently consumed on Earth per year is so small uh, that the, the total amount of revenue would be too small. You say, okay, well, what right. if we increase the throughput by a factor of 100? Well, I don't think the cost will maintain very, like it's yeah. high, it's like price elasticity will cause the cost to reduce. Okay, what if demand increases by a factor of 100? Well, then probably the supply chain on the surface of the Earth where the crust is largely made of like either already very nicely processed minerals with all kinds of oil concentrations everywhere, surrounded by well-trained people who have an ambient atmosphere they can breathe and supply chains <laughs> to extract materials, um, and or uh, like crashed meteorites that that like have already concentrated like platinum grit metals on the surface of the earth. So, for example, like a lot of South African gold mining almost certainly uh, you know, arrived in the form of a, a meteorite uh, impact you know, millions of years mm -hmm. ago uh, and, and remained relatively close to the surface of the earth, uh, to the surface of the crust. Um, so it's, it's really hard, given that, you know, Mars and the Moon and asteroids and stuff are all made of the same stuff that Earth is, that you could imagine there being a, a, a thing that makes reverse trade worthwhile. Um, and actually, while, while I'm on the soapbox, um, some people have said, oh, well, you know, uh, shipping shipping materials from Mars back to Earth is obviously way too ridiculously expensive and simple ship back ideas. So, like, on Mars, you'll have uh, innovators and they'll be coming up with, with cool software that you can ship back to Earth. And I read the numbers on this, and it also doesn't make any sense because, um, because obviously the, the shipping cost of data either way is, is roughly the same, and it's very low. So if you are uh, an, you know, a technician operating on Mars, um, especially in the early days, it, it makes a lot of sense to have a team of, of uh, support technicians on the Earth writing software for you. Uh, so you say, mm -hmm. I need software to do this, and they go and do it, and then they just beam it up to you, and then you have that software. So like, uh, given that you, know, you can telecommute, you can work remotely for software work, it makes no sense to put your software engineer on Mars where like the you know per day burn rate of operating someone on Mars is probably on the order of like at best $50,000 or something like it's a staggeringly high cost. Um, so, so anyone who can remote can work remotely from Earth certainly will. Um, so it's a tough one. Yeah, uh, that, that's why SpaceX needs to 
you know, create this river of gold, you know, uh, ocean, tumult, you know, torrent, ocean of gold from from Starlink to, to fund the fund the city. I think you know, once on the city, you know, people who live in the city, entrepreneurs and and people who work there will will do quite well. Um, well, I was going to get to that. Yeah. So once you have a community, it still needs net through step net input. You know. Yeah. So what you're saying is, once you have a critical mass of people who are all on the planet, it's a lot more efficient to buy things from each other than to have everything shipped from Earth. But the idea of them getting wealthy by shipping stuff back to Earth doesn't make much sense in your view. Is that a good way? Of I, I think it? it's it's highly unlikely that there would be. I mean, I'm saying there'd be zero value transfer back to Earth, but like not enough, right? To to cover costs, not not it couldn't it mm -hmm. couldn't even be remotely close. Um, I'm quite convinced of that. You, you don't think that there's anything that might have some like intangible value, like the fact that it came from Mars, that would be you know in and of itself. Uh, worth paying a huge premium for, for, I don't know, collectors or. Yeah, you know. for sure. I mean, like, you know, a fancy colored Mars rock or something, by all means, yeah. it'd be a, a roaring trade in those. But like, I don't think anyone seriously thinks that there's like a deep enough market on earth buying fancy colored Mars rocks at whatever nominated price there is to like fund sending a hundred thousand tons of cargo to Mars every year. Like that's just beyond ridiculous. So, um, right. It would be nice if that were true, but I don't think, I don't think anyone could, could really like uh, bank upon that occurring. Makes sense. Well, I got one other question on this topic before maybe we see if we can turn over one more rock before our, <laughs> our interview runs out of time. And that is that, okay, that seems like a pretty, you know, reasonable argument uh, that that you've been making about, uh, you know, the, the lack of opportunities to export things back to earth. It's just so much bigger, more established, more talented people. But what about exporting space goods from the surfaces of planets like Mars? to other uh, space locations where now they have a gravity advantage over shipping stuff from, from Earth. Do you see that as uh, playing an important role? And maybe it's not Mars, maybe it's lower gravity locations like the moon or or, rock, or uh, asteroids, but. Potentially, um, but it, 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 it'd be hard to tell, right? But like the, the whole point of Starship is that it, it makes a deep gravity world relatively inconsequential. Mm -hmm. Right. So like, sure, you can launch single stage to orbit from Mars relatively easily, or you could even launch single stage from Mars back to Earth or single stage from Mars to anywhere, frankly, frankly. Um, but you still have to pay for fuel on Mars and fuel on Mars will always be much more expensive than fuel on Earth. Um, and so if, if Starship is successful in basically transforming the marginal cost of launching stuff to orbit into whatever the cost of the fuel is, and sure, to launch stuff into orbit from Earth, you need two stages and a lot more fuel. But the fuel cost is almost certainly um, the, the fuel cost differential is almost certainly lower than the quote unquote gear ratio, which is to say, mm -hmm. you know, how much fuel you need per mass per kilogram of mass right. to put into orbit. So um, I'm not, uh, I'm not. Well, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go out on a limb and say one way or the other. But um, but certainly, like the, the oh, it's lower delta v argument from here. Uh, argument really has to contend with the fact that it is relatively much, much cheaper to launch things from Earth and always will be than to launch them from anywhere else. Um, this is kind of the major the major sticking point that I have with um, people who think that we should use uh, water water ice that's trapped in the South Pole region of the moon, for example, to make fuel for some other purpose, mm -hmm. which is that um, because the moon doesn't have an atmosphere, it, it charges you delta V when you go down and when you go back up. Um, obviously, when you launch, you still have to pay, but, but also to land. Uh, and so like, <laughs> It turns out that the, the net amount of uh, delta V required to uh, transport something to the surface of the moon is actually higher than it is to transport something to the surface of Mars. But because on Mars, you can use the atmosphere as a, as a giant uh, brake skid to slow you down on the way in, uh, the, all, all but the, the, the very last bit of landing. Um, obviously, mm -hmm. it takes a lot more time to get to Mars than to get to the moon. Um, so yeah, just, just to kind of, just to get fuel off the surface of the moon and then into like low lunar orbit and where from where you could presumably use some sort of high ISP solar powered uh, electric propulsion tug to take it somewhere else, uh, you know, uses up about 80% of the fuel that you created on the surface of the moon. So I think that by itself eliminates the advantage of, uh, of launching from the moon as opposed to from the surface of the earth. Yeah, that, mm -hmm. I know, we, I, we I like rain on the trades all day long. Um, but <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's, it's, it's good. We get a variety of opinions here. And of course, mm -hmm. nobody really knows that some of these arguments are definitely testable. Right. Yeah. And, um, yeah. you know, I mean, I like your, yeah, that earlier point that, you know, 
once we've done it, then we'll know, right? Once we built the city on Mars, then we'll know what cities on Mars look like. And the people who live there will know so much more about it than anything that we actually know right now. So, you know, a lot of this is yeah. theoretical, but that's one of the things that we, you know, like to explore on the podcast is, you know, look at the different ways that this all could, you know, could end up. And um, there was, yeah, you know, sure. speaking of which, actually, you know, we're kind of talking about Starship and how that, you know, that will make it so much cheaper to put, to produce and ship high value goods from earth to, you know, out into the solar system. Um, one of the, one of the listeners asked um, for the long term, is Starship still the right idea or will we eventually need another concept like a space elevator in order to kind of keep this uh, economy or, or even growth going? Yeah. Hi, Aiden. Uh, that's a good question. Um, so before Starship, it came along, I, I did do a lot of, I spent a lot of time looking into space elevators. So I did, you know, uh, structural calculations and simulations of things like um, vibration, vibrating modes in the space elevator. So it, it can wobble like a guitar string, but because mm -hmm. one end is under a lot less tension than the other, the the speed that the, that the waves move varies as you go up and down, which means that the amplitude varies as well. So it's a little bit like cracking a whip or something like that. So there's all kinds of really, really neat, fun physics and maths to do with, um, with uh with space elevators um however uh it's it's extremely hard to see a future where a space elevator is cheaper than something like starship uh just in the same way that that um you know it's, it's not really an accident that it's cheaper to fly a 737 than to take a train yeah uh to the same destination if, and it's also slower if, to take a train right? if we were already building space elevators and then starship came along it would maybe put things on a different footing because it would have the technical maturity and the momentum that would make it harder for SpaceX or Starship or something like it to, to catch up. But you're saying because that will almost certainly arrive first to justify the investment in the space elevator when this other technology is already maturing and getting cheaper every year sounds unlikely. Yeah. Saying. Well, I think it's important to point out that it's not just we don't know how to express space elevators, but like the material science that you would need to make a space elevator is like at the limits of what is physically possible. Like we mm -hmm. know that for sure. It's not that like next year we'll figure out how to make stronger kind of material that, that does it. It's like there are certain physical limits to how strong atoms can stick to one another. We know what they are. We know what all the atoms are. It's kind of the end of the story. Um, and so even if we, you know, develop nanobots that could do the full self replicating city on Mars all by themselves, you know, and you could fit them in a vial, you know, you know, the size of my pinky finger or something, then um, that, you know, we could we could program them to extrude a, a space elevator from a conveniently positioned asteroid, blah, blah, blah. Well, maybe we could, but, um, it still seems to be wildly unlikely that um, that a that would be possible, and b if if we knew how to do that, that a space elevator would be the thing that we'd go and build with it. Um, there's many other kind of worthy challenges, worthy things to build. Um, so, for example, if you had that technology, then you wouldn't need to launch vast quantities of mass into space. You would just launch relatively small uh, landing capsules that would then um, simply 3D print replica of you on Mars, and then you'd get up and walk around. Um, so you wouldn't need a space <laughs> elevator. Um, which is a shame, and it is easier to build a space elevator on on you know smaller smaller bodies and moons and things perhaps. But I, uh, rockets are really really awesome. And actually, in the case of of, of railroads and, and planes, for example, like railroads were around before planes, and yet you know railroads are not a growing segment of our transportation infrastructure. But uh, I don't I don't like that fact. You're here. I love trains. I've tra take, taken trains all over yeah. the world. I've taken Everybody trains loves all trains. Yeah. But but um, yeah. But you know that there's a reason. You know, like the fact that a plane is cheaper than a train to transport humans between any two different points. It actually comes back to something I was saying about Starlink earlier, which is that you know the, the marginal cost of adding a, a new satellite or adding a new consumer is 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 relatively small and also pays itself off very quickly, which is also the case with a plane. So if you fly a plane, um, there's about fifteen thousand airports in the United States you can land at, and if you want to add another airport, you can just build an airport. And then mm. any plane can fly from any of those 15,000 airports directly to your airport. They don't have to go and build a new rail line spur somewhere. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, right. So, so like, it's just a much more efficient kind of usage of capital expense. Um, yeah. There's, there's no kind of massive upfront investment required to like drill holes through mountains or anything like that. And the same thing kind of goes with stuff, goes to Starlink and as a, as a mechanism for trans transmitting internet and the same it goes to space elevators, which is, you know, if you want to build a 1000 trillion ton, uh, you know, carbon graphene, you know, 10 meter wide cable that comes down from an asteroid to the surface of the earth will go for your life. But I very much doubt that it'll be cheaper than flying starships long term. Yeah.
Yeah. Agreed. Are there any concerns long term with the throughput? You know, like if say we have starships, we have the ability to, you know, have a low marginal cost to add another spaceport somewhere, um, or you know, build a, another you know another starship to do you know more launches per day or whatnot. Um, I mean, is there it, is there a time when we approach the the just the fundamental limit of how many starships we can launch from Earth at a time, and we would need something with a bigger throughput, even if it's more expensive? Mm. Oh, well, uh, Starships have much higher throughput capability than, than a space than a single space elevator, no question. Um, so yeah. so just SpaceX's position is that they want to do a million tons to low Earth orbit a year. So it's about 150 tons per launch. Um, so that's uh, around about um, 7,000 launches a year or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so it's uh, roughly 20 launches a day. So that's not, that, that's not very many. Like that sounds like a lot, sounds like a big number. But um, there's about 30,000 commercial uh, air flights in the United States every day. So like, it's a factor of 1,000 times less than the number of jets taking off and landing. Um, from, and actually, there's only about uh, maybe 800 or so major commercial airports in the United States. Um, you know, most of the airports are kind of small, uh, small paved strips you know, that service individual towns somewhere that are not towered airports. Um, so you know, 20, 20 launches a day might be a challenge off one launch pad. But building another launch pad is not all that difficult, as we've seen. Um, so you know, we might have an, end up in a situation where you have, I don't know, ten launch pads in Texas and ten launch pads in Florida, and that's more than enough to to kind of um, support a million tons. A million tons is not is not that much, you know. Like as I said before, a very large container ship carries something like three hundred thousand tons of cargo. So yeah. um, is that right? Yeah, it's about right. Um, and and a large container ship can dock. And then be unloaded and then reloaded and then undock in like i think 36 hours so so like a single uh 400 and something meter long siding uh in a, in a deep water port can can move 300,000 tons in 36 hours uh actually more than that because it's like unloading and then reloading so maybe like 500,000 tons in in 36 hours so it's like it sounds like a big number and, it, and for space stuff it is a huge number uh but in the grand scheme of things a million tons is not that much stuff yeah so you're saying that the infrastructure for space is not going to be somehow inherently limited as we expand that we could because the earth uh, 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 transport system is already so much bigger than space we would just utilize that more uh, for more of the time for space activities. Yeah, I think I mean, I, I, I can't say this for sure, uh, but at some point it might be we might see a transition away from like break bulk cargo to containerized cargo for starships. Mm -hmm. So you could imagine like a starship standard shipping container, which would be not that much different from an airline. Uh, you know, as an ATC, um, yeah. airline transport container, uh, like thin, thin wall aluminium standard sized thing that's that's kind of set up for handling, um, that can easily move it through you know Starship's side door and be handled by the crane and then be interfacing with various rovers and things on the ground. Um, cool. But I don't really yeah. know. I think at the end of the day, like yeah. that one of the nice things about Starship is if you need to put a bigger door on the side, it's not all that hard to engineer. Um, yeah. Whereas if you know if it was some kind of um, incredibly complicated um, you know, carbon fiber structure or something, it might be significantly more difficult to like change the, the tooling to produce a different sized uh, you know, uh, port or door or whatever. Um, so if you imagine like uh, a Starship flight to Mars that's carrying a lot of extremely heavy machinery, uh, like very, very large um, diggers or something like that, then you might want to have you know uh, the ability to, to load those and unload those as a single piece. Um, but that's just a just spitballing here. So uh, I wanted to ask, um, I think we're gonna have to wrap up soon, but before we get there, you know, I, I want to ask you your thoughts on, you know, why, why go to space at all, right? I mean, you've mentioned from an economic perspective, you're probably not going to export from space into earth enough, you know, high value goods to, you know, to make it pay off to establish a city on Mars. But, you know, like clearly you're, you're very interested and passionate about, you know, about these topics and getting to space. So, so what is it that drives you? Why, why should we go to space at mm. all? I think it's a good question. Um, I've, I've kind of explored this question in various ways uh, over maybe the last decade. Um, you know, it's like, oh, we should go there in case Earth gets wiped out. Uh, we should go there to open, reopen the frontier. Uh, you know, we should go there to you know, provide hope and, and joy for humans on Earth. Um, I think it's cool. There's very strategic reasons we should do it. Um, but I think at the end of the day, um, it's like one of those questions where if you have to ask, you know, you can't afford it. Um, and, <laughs> um, and the thing is like, maybe not all humans feel this way, 
or I should say like another good reason to go to space is that like like me, you're like some kind of socially maladjusted misanthrope who thinks that everything would be better once you go to space. Um, but um, the I think at the end of the day, like some some number of humans, some fraction perhaps, um, will always remain fairly enthusiastic about about uh, moving somewhere new. Um, and certainly myself as an immigrant, I have some recollection of that. So last September, actually a uh, week and a half ago, still September, was the uh, 12th anniversary of my landing in the United States. Mm -hmm. And um, and I, that's actually like a particular place on Catalina Avenue in, in uh, Pasadena, which is like essentially the part where I conceptualized like stepping out of the airport cab and like into my new life. And mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, a lot of people mm -hmm. kind of uh, see see that as part of the human story um, yeah. and something that's worthwhile doing. And uh, and certainly like, you know, we've evolved to be that way and here's how, here's how we are. So maybe we just do it because we can't not do it. <laughs> I like it. That's yeah. that's uh, you know largely where I've gotten to, and and uh, a previous interview where Daniel Fox talked a lot about that. That you know we nature grows and expands, and we are part of that. You know, and and have that drive. And, and I think you're right. A lot of people aren't going to want to go, but you know, there's a portion of of us, you know, myself included, that you know, I always want to go explore. So um, yeah, I think it'd be super neat. Like yeah. Like I don't, I don't, I don't have any aspirations to be like the first person on Mars or anything like that. But, but um, you know, if, even if only through my writing and maybe hopefully down the track through you know mechanical engineering or something, like you know, to be one of a million people who like figures something out, like it's like a million people working for twenty years is a huge work product, right? So like, yeah, one person's <laughs> contribution to that is necessarily kind of marginal, but um, but I think it's it's a cool story to be part of. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it's certainly a cool, cool project around which to organize, you know, the aspirations and dreams of, of like the smartest and brightest people of a generation. Yeah. Um, it's certainly, you know, like there's, there's a kind of a worthier challenge before us immediately, which is stabilizing the Earth's climate. But I think by the time we're done doing that, we will be so much more capable in an industrial sense that really like doing the same thing to another planet is only the only kind of uh, appreciable next step mm -hmm. or worthwhile yeah. next step. We're we're already doing geoengineering, so once we figure out how to do it the right way here, it should just be a, a, a small perturbation, right, to do it on mm. another planet. Well, we've been doing it on Earth for thousands of years. I mean, that's kind of an unappreciated yeah. fact, but like yeah. um, right. the climate has already, uh, you know, had measurable excursions uh, in, in historic and prehistoric time due to human activities on the surface of the Earth. Um, and so, you know, I think that I don't see that stopping anytime soon, but we could be a little bit more deliberate about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I meant. Sort of the, yeah. the, the intentional uh, tra transformation. Anyway, uh, Casey Hanmer, thank you so much for taking some time to uh, to uh, talk with us today. I, I think it was really interesting. And um, yeah, thank you. Uh, we, it's a yeah, you're yeah, welcome. Absolutely. And yeah, also thanks to everybody who uh, who joined us live to uh, to watch the uh, the recording of this and and ask questions live. Um, and yeah, like you know, Jeff said, uh, Casey, thank you so much for for joining us. Um, if you're listening in uh, and you have any suggestions for future topics, uh, people you'd like to interview or just uh, be part of the conversation, you can uh, reach out to us via email, ourfutureinspace at orbitalassembly.com, or you can interact with us on Twitter at Our Future Space and Facebook at Our Future in Space. And if you like what we're doing at Orbital Assembly and are interested in contributing in other ways, feel free to reach out to info at orbitalassembly.com. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Be well. This program represents the personal opinions of the hosts and their guests. The content, opinions, and views do not necessarily represent the views and opinions of Orbital Assembly Corporation, nor the organizations with which any of the program participants may be affiliated. The mere appearance or promotion of this program does not constitute an endorsement by Orbital Assembly Corporation or its affiliates. Our Future in Space. Copyright 2022, Orbital Assembly Corporation. Hosts, Dr. Jeff Greenblatt. And they record audio and video production by Tim Alatori. Musical theme, The Last Day by Dark Blue Studio.